I think my sister's boyfriend is infatuated with my son. This was a story that began a month ago on True Off My Chest, which originally had its own best of Redditor updates, but over the last week there's been an extra update to bring on to all of this, so for those unfamiliar with the escalating events, we'll start from the beginning and reach our way to the update. Throw away since my sister's boyfriend is an avid Reddit user. This might be a long one, so bear with me. I'm a 38 female, a single mother living on a waitress salary. Times are tough right now, and due to unforeseen circumstances, I've had to move in with my sister for the past couple of months. It's not an ideal situation, but I'm doing my best. I have an ex-husband, male 40, who is emotionally abusive, hence the divorce. We share custody of my incredible son, let's call him Roman, 13, who has been so understanding of our financial situation, even at his age, I love him more than I love myself. He is kind and intelligent. He stole my ex-husband's face, unfortunately. So he's beautiful. Every mama will say their son is beautiful, but my kid really is stunningly gorgeous. The amount of adults my age and older who have given him the creepy and unwarranted he's going to be a heartbreaker in a few years comments would alarm you. He has ADHD, but maintains decent grades. He plays a sport and is good at it. He's got lots of friends who he visits often and vice versa. Despite the changes in our living situation, he is thriving and I'd do anything to keep that up. My sister, let's call her Sarah, 42, and her boyfriend, let's call him David, 44, are well off and live in a massive house. My sister was happy to take me in, but a boyfriend, David, not so much which I completely understand. I offered to pay rent, but my sister won't have any of it. So I do chores around the house and cook as often as my work schedule will let me. I never saw much of David anyway. He was often at the bar with his friends or working or locked in his room playing video games. But when we did see each other, he acted like I didn't exist. My son Roman was staying with his dad for a while as I was figuring things out. And I was worried about David's attitude once my son moved in with us. I talked to David and promised him that Roman would be respectful and well behaved, but he was weird about it and shrugged me off. Then David met Roman. David is absolutely fascinated with my kid. His disposition changed so quickly that it gave me whiplash. Suddenly, he stopped locking himself in his room and has decided to spend time with us. Well, mostly my son. He helps Roman with his homework. He watches all of Roman's favorite shows so they can talk about them together. He buys him food and gifts. My sister Sarah is over the moon. She's been telling me how, how about us moving in has been the best thing for their relationship because David is happier now. I thought it was sweet at first, but in the back of my head, I think something more nefarious could be going on. To paint a clearer picture, I've noted some other changes. I've noticed that I can't decide whether they're innocent or not. One, David texts my son often, which wouldn't be weird, except he does it while he's at school. The texts themselves aren't weird at all, but David lightly scolds him for not replying sometimes. Two, before my son moved in, David was rarely ever home during the afternoon or evenings. He'd stay out after work and go drinking with his buddies until late in the night, a habit he's had for years, according to my sister. Now he's home all the time. He gets home before Roman gets off the bus around 3.15 if he's not at practice and stays home all day, even offering to babysit while I'm working through the evening. He still drinks just in the house. Last Wednesday, I woke up to use the bathroom during the middle of the night. To get to the bathroom, you have to pass by my son's room. I was surprised to see that the door was closed all the way since Roman always likes it open because his room gets hot at night. Also, he has been staying up late texting his friends lately, which has caused him to sleep through his alarm and miss the bus some days. So that night, I opened the door to let the air in and make sure he was asleep. And there was David, standing by Roman's bed in the dark. He stated that he was looking for his cell phone, but I saw him jump with anxiety when I opened the door. He left quickly, muttering something about how it might be in the kitchen. Why would his phone be in my son's room? And why was the door closed? David also offers to drive my son everywhere he needs to go. Only him. School, if he misses the bus. Practice his friend's houses. This is the same man who wouldn't lift a finger for me until my son moved in. It's been incredibly helpful since I'm not home often, but a part of me wonders if he's doing it for the wrong reasons. I also caught David doing Roman's laundry, resulting in a few articles of clothing going missing. This one irritated me because I make my son do his own laundry. I asked him not to do this, but his excuse is that he is trying to save water.
water. I don't know how to fight him on this, since it is his house. I am terrified to bring this up to my sister. Am I reading into things too much? Am I silly for worrying that he might have ulterior motives? If I tell my sister that she gets angry and there's nothing going on, she'll kick us out and we'll be homeless. So quite a few suspicious behaviors going on. And obviously not in the best of circumstances where you can easily get away from them and still be completely fine with your life. Now while some of these things might be excused as the idea that possibly, hey, David probably just really likes the idea of having a, what could be perceived as like a younger brother or even a son living in the house. But of course this third point, being in his room at night trying to find a cell phone, yeah, that got a lot of the comments to be very suspicious as to these uh, motives. I mean, hey, yeah, you can understand that maybe they didn't want to call the phone to avoid waking people if it was in his room, but also searching the room with the door closed, especially if it was already open in the first place. Yeah, very sus. But just a day later, we get an update to it all. They begin with a brief paragraph thanking everyone for their advice and comments. Secondly, I'd like to clarify a few things. I did not let my child in David's car after the bedroom incident. I would never do that. After this occurrence, tied with the laundry situation, I began to take note of David's behavior, which is when I started putting the pieces together. I came to Reddit shortly after, and here we are, unfortunately. Third, I'd like to address a couple of questions I've seen. One, David is not on any offender registry. Two, by saying saving water. David meant that he combines loads of laundry, meaning that he'll do his laundry and Roman's laundry in the same load. The laundry that I've seen go missing are mostly socks, which is typical, even when Roman was doing his laundry. But then, Roman told me that he was missing a couple of shirts and a pair of underwear. That alarmed me, since this only happened once David started doing his laundry. Massive red flag. Three, the texts between them really are innocent. David asking him what he wants for dinner, what time he should pick him up, discussing shows they've been watching. But based on his other behavior, it's clearly a grooming tactic, and I'll be sure that it stops immediately. No way in hell should he be texting my kid at school. For the bedroom situation, in clearer detail, I peeked in to make sure that Roman was asleep, and David was at the foot of his bed. The room was, of course, pitch black, and I was groggy as hell, so I didn't even register that it was him until he pushed past me to leave. I checked on my son afterwards. He was still asleep, and the blankets were fully over him. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary, but maybe I just intervened at the right moment? I made sure his door was open, and I left my door open as well so I could listen for any footsteps. I could not sleep after that happened. It wasn't sitting right with me. Fourth, I'll discuss everything with my son tonight once I get off work. A lot of you said it was a good idea, and I was already planning on doing it. He has not been acting strange in any way, and his usual happy self, but that doesn't mean that David hasn't done anything yet. That reality is terrifying to me, and I pray that's not the case. I pretty much have a clear idea on what to say to him, but I am not sure if I should explicitly tell him that I found David in his room or that he might be stealing his clothing. Any suggestions on how to go about this conversation are welcome. Fifth, I fully plan to confront David and talk to my sister Sarah about this. I am not a doormat and I will do anything to keep my son safe. David is on a church retreat and thankfully has not been home for a few days. Of course this man is related to the church. I've decided to speak with my sister first in case David twists my words or manipulates her into believing that nothing is wrong. And once he returns, I'll confront him based on how my sister reacts. Any other suggestions on how to go about it are welcome as well. The OP further goes on about setting up the idea of cameras, drug testing a son, searching for this missing clothing, as well as agreeing that ultimately she needs to get out of this house. Hesitant to give her son to the ex-husband for a while as he is again an abusive person, looking for homeless shelters for herself, but overall regretting that she didn't intervene earlier about all this. So a few days later, the next update comes around where the OP confronts each person in this drama. And as summarized here in the beginning, things did not go well. My first conversation was with my son, which occurred the night I posted my first update. In fear of this post getting removed, like my first one, I'll have to censor myself, but I think you'll understand to what I'm referring to, that when I say that I asked my son the serious and explicit questions, Roman adamantly denied that David did anything to him. He seemed surprised that I asked. He said he would have told me if he had. I believe him. I know he could be lying, but I'm trying to take his word for it. My son and I have a very open and transparent relationship. The first time my ex-husband ever verbally abused him, he came straight to me and told me about it. My guard is up, but I have to give him the benefit of the doubt. Like you all advised me, I didn't bring up the bedroom or laundry situation, but I was honest with him and told him that David's behavior towards him was inappropriate. We had a talk about boundaries, saying no, consent, etc. I drilled into him that David is not to drive him anywhere 
anywhere, text him anymore, and be around him alone under any circumstances. I also explained what grooming is, and that it's what David has been doing to him. He said he knew about it through a school assembly. Then he said something that broke my heart. He apologized for letting David treat him that way, that he shouldn't have fell for it. His exact words. I assured him that none of this was his fault. I want him to make it clear to himself that David is not preying on him because of how he looks or how he acts. He is doing it because he is a predator and they prey on the vulnerable. Honestly, I could tell that the conversation had left him a little shell-shocked. To know that the person you liked and trusted isn't who you thought he was would leave any kid rattled. For the entire rest of the night, he followed me around like a lost puppy. It did break my heart a little to see him like that, but I don't want him to feel a false sense of security around David, so I have no regrets about it. Sarah was next. I knew it would turn into an argument before the conversation even began. It's always been that way with her. My sister is nice, but not kind. She'll take you in off the street, but then throw it back in your face if you cross her. So I knew what I was getting into, but I had to do it, not only for my kid's sake, but for hers. This is not a man I want her to be with, have children with, nor do I want him in our family. I told her that I was uncomfortable with the way David acts around Roman, and that I think it's a lot deeper than what he portrays it to be. I mentioned that I didn't like the gift giving and the constant texting, and I brought up the bedroom and laundry incidents. Like I predicted, she was more offended that I was accusing her boyfriend of grooming my son. She didn't see how that was proof of anything. Do you know how many socks and pairs of underwear I've lost while doing laundry? It's probably stuck somewhere in the dryer. The more I expressed my concerns, the more defensive she got. She thinks I'm manic, essentially. She said that as soon as things get good for me, roof over my head, food in the fridge, a steady job, I intentionally screw it up because deep down I don't think I deserve happiness. That she tries to help me every time, but I end up stabbing her in the back like I am right now. So, she doesn't believe me. That's her prerogative. Fine. I told her that I won't be staying at her house much longer and that I don't want David around my kid anymore. That we'll be keeping to ourselves for the rest of my short time here. She's letting me stay, surprisingly, but she said she's glad to see me go. She swore up and down that David would never hurt Roman and that she was sad to see their relationship ruined over an accusation with no real basis. That I shouldn't let my self-destructive behavior and my bipolar paranoia get in the way of other people's happiness. And that I better not accuse her boyfriend of being a predator anymore. Essentially, she kept shifting the blame onto me, so I ended it there. Oh, and she told me that she wants reimbursement for things like clothing and grocery shopping because apparently we are draining her wallet with buying so much food. Yes, an eighth grader going through a growth spurt eats a lot. Shocker. But I apologized and said I'd buy his and my groceries from now on. Now, David came back from his church retreat Friday morning, which is when I confronted him. I was very upset, so I didn't go easy on him. He was thrown off by my hostility, but once he understood what I was implying, his demeanor shifted. Sit down, sit down, let's talk about it, he kept saying. Except he was the one who was nervous and looked like on the brink of a panic attack. Yeah, sorry David, but that reaction doesn't really do you any favors. The fact he already knows what she's upset about. I mean, it's one thing to be clueless as to how you're coming across, it's another to be aware of it. I kept my composure. I asked him why he was in my son's room in the middle of the night with the door shut. He gave me the same excuse, that he was looking for his cell phone. I asked him why he couldn't have gone for it in the morning. He said that he set the alarm to 5am for work and that he didn't want it to go off with my son in the room and wake him up. I asked him why he was standing over my son's bed. He admitted that he was trying to wake him up and ask him if he'd seen his phone. But did he not just say that he didn't want the alarm to wake him up? I asked him what on earth would compel him to think it is okay to wake up my child in the middle of the night to help him look for a cell phone. He said he wasn't thinking straight and that he was sorry. Okay, but hold up. I can understand his reasoning here. He's calling out to Roman this late at night to wake him up a bit earlier in his sleep to help him find his cell phone so that he doesn't leave it in the room where Roman could be woken up at 5 a.m. instead. Like, I'd rather be woken up an hour into my sleep than being enforceably woken up like an hour early. It's, it's weird, but it makes sense. I can see that. Now, before you label me as someone defending this man, <laughs> I would think that if that was the case, he would have been comfortable staying in the room to continue whispering for Roman to wake up the moment that Opie opened the door. Maybe he was embarrassed by the situation. Either way, still doesn't really do much to defend him. I asked him about the missing laundry as well. He adamantly denied what I was implying. He said that his and my sister's clothing get lost in the laundry all the time. That he would help me find my son's missing clothing, all while apologizing profusely. I'll admit, I was thrown off by how apologetic he was, and it made me a little soft. I thanked him for letting us 
stay in his house and I apologized for not setting boundaries earlier, but I told him that from now on, I didn't feel comfortable with him being around my son. No more driving him places, buying him gifts, texting him, helping him with homework, doing his laundry, etc. I essentially told him that he is no longer allowed to be alone with my son or touches things under any circumstances. But here's where things become a bit shaky in terms of the OP certainty that he's definitely what we're all being implied is the case. He broke down in tears. He was hysterical. The thought of me believing that he is preying on my son made him miserable. That he'd never do that. He said, I love him like a father loves a son. When reading my original post, a lot of you believed the same thing at first. So did I. But I just don't like the way David looks at him. Yes, I see the kindness in his eyes towards my son as he helps him with homework or watches a show with him. But there is a nuance of something covetous and sinister that I can't shake off. Anyway, I told him that it's unhealthy for him to be so fixated on a child and that he cannot depend on my kid for happiness. I told him that we'd be leaving very soon. More on that later. But I didn't tell him where or when it was happening. He asked if there was anything he could do to rectify the situation. He suggested that the four of us sit down and talk about it. I declined. I reiterated that he is not allowed near my kid anymore and left it at that. A small part of me feels like I was too harsh on him overall. Maybe he was just looking for his phone. Maybe it's a coincidence that articles of clothing are missing. But he was on his knees, sobbing, like I had just pulled the rug out from underneath him. For a child, he hasn't known for that long. I don't think he was devastated that I'd accused him of being a predator. He was devastated that I revoked his access to my child. I'm not stupid. I once witnessed this man argue with my sister. Brutal, verbal assaults from both sides, which ended in my sister crying. He didn't shed a tear. Again, to be fair, I feel like that just makes him a misogynist. Doesn't really, you know, like, there are many men out there who are very nice to fellow boys and men and not at all nice to women. To summarize the rest of this post, OP has been watching their child like a hawk, not giving David any chances to be really in contact with him whatsoever, blocking his number, and sleeping in the same room together. She's not going to go through drug testing, Roman, doesn't think it's necessary anymore, can trust that they're not texting behind OP's back, purchased a nanny cam in the meanwhile, waiting for that to arrive to catch any weird activity that might be happening while they're away. Over the last weekend, while David has returned, they've been staying at a motel. Obviously not the most comfortable or safe of places to be, but safer than a possible predator's house. Unfortunately, a woman's shelter is out of the equation, as she doesn't have a car and the soonest one is over an hour away by travel. Sadly, it's just something that's too much of a disruption to their work and school life that makes it impossible to do. But in good news, OP did apply for some public housing a while back and apparently it's in the process of getting reviewed. Oh, sorry, getting approved. So overall, yeah, seems like they're losing the comfortable situation they were originally in, but on the bright side, it looks like there's some light at the end of the tunnel. And at the time, while comments were obviously in support of everything the mother was doing here, best she can in these situations, David's situation continues to be suspicious. While his reaction to being confronted on his behavior is somewhat suspicious, almost as if he knew he was guilty to what he was doing, I can't help but wonder. Is he acting all hysterical and sobbing because he's ashamed of how he's coming across or he's afraid of being accused of something like this because of the fact, hey, he works in the church. He does have a genuine bond towards Roman that he really cherishes and loves and has never really experienced before himself by having a son. The sister's accusation here about OP wouldn't be something that came out of thin air. Is this possibly OP being protective of her child because of her own abusive ex that seeing another father figure come into the picture without her approval? It is possible she's read a bit too much into everything. Well, in the third update, we realize that all my attempts to make some weird theory that twists this whole tale into OP being the bad person are actually completely pointless, and you were right to think that he's a better. Anyway, my attempt to gaslight you aside, I guess I'll start off by saying that my son and I weren't in the house much up until Friday of this week. We'd been staying at a local motel that's decently close to his school and where I work. I am a waitress at a restaurant, and my manager knows I'm dealing with housing issues, so he's been a bit understanding with me when I call out. But when you don't work, you don't get paid, and between the lifts, takeouts, and motel costs, my wallet isn't doing so great, but I'm 100% making it work. But since we weren't at the house, things sort of escalated a bit. David's number is blocked on Roman's phone, but he found him on TikTok and Instagram on Monday night and messaged him there. Nothing explicit in the messages, just things like, did you block my number? I really miss talking to you. Is everything okay? Maybe in the future, we can talk to each other again. I'm sorry if I upset you or your mom. Are you and your mom safe? Where are you staying? Respond to me when you get a moment. I have something important to tell you. Now again, it sounds like 
like it's just someone sounding concerned over someone. It's not really sounding too creepy. At most, it's like an annoying friend who won't leave you alone. But this is only the start of things. I was livid when my son showed me. I think what set me off the most is that I know David messaged him because he thought my kid would respond without telling me. He thinks they have some secret private relationship right under my nose that I'm interfering with. I'm pretty sure that's why he hasn't kicked me out of his house. He's not mad, just miserable and desperate for some sort of contact. I feel like no matter how hard I pull my son away from David, he's refusing to let go. We blocked the Instagram and TikTok accounts immediately and I screenshotted the messages. I'm trying to keep a record of everything. I asked Roman to delete his Snapchat account just in case, but he didn't want to do that. I'm 99% sure he has a girl on there that he likes. Aww. I let that slide because he came straight to me about the other accounts and he agreed not to add any new accounts on Snapchat or post anything that gave away our location for the time being. The entire ordeal upset my son. He broke down in tears when he came back from school the next day. That hurt a lot to see. I don't know if I expressed this, but Roman genuinely liked David and they got along well. Maybe my kids saw him as a father figure since he was shunned and neglected by my ex-husband. I think I underestimated the mental toll it would take on him to have to cut David off completely and then block him when he reached out privately. Someone noted that I should get him into therapy soon. I plan on doing that once we are securely living on our own and I find the money for it. It's definitely a priority. David's harassment spilled over to me too. He called me multiple times and texted me things like, let me know when you're back so we can resolve this. Am I allowed to attend Roman's baseball game on Thursday with you? I'd like to support him. Can you please answer? I'd really like to talk. Just us. I'm sorry if I gave you both the wrong impression. I didn't block his number on my phone. I figured that the more he talked, the more likely he'd continue to incriminate himself and I could use his words against him. I didn't answer a single one of his questions, but I did let him know that if he contacted my kid ever again, or if he showed up to his school or any events, that I'd go straight to the police. And that's not an empty threat either. Unbeknownst to him, I am getting the police involved because I now have solid evidence that this man has a sick obsession with my child. Now this is the bad news. And I'll forewarn you that if you're easily triggered, please don't read any further. Or at least skip this and the next two paragraphs. I want to thank you all for confirming my suspicions in the first post because I found something heinous. I mentioned that I plan to set up a camera in Roman's room. I asked for his permission first and he said that he didn't care since we're barely in the house anymore. The camera I chose is motion sensitive and links the footage to my iPhone so I can watch it anywhere. The camera was set up on Sunday night as soon as I received the package and I hid it above the doorframe so that it overlooked the entire room. You can't see it unless you use a ladder. I didn't get anything for a couple of days. I was randomly notified of movement in the bedroom but saw nothing when I looked at the footage. But on Wednesday evening at around 6, David came into my son's room, stood there for a moment and then left. No longer than a minute. An hour-ish later, he returned and started going through his drawers. He picked up a specific garment and left within less than two minutes. I wanted to throw up. I didn't sleep that entire night at the motel. The following day, I had someone cover my shift, which gave me the opportunity to do a deep search of David's room while he was at work and my son was at school. I found the article of clothing inside of his pillowcase, on top of the pillow, right where he would lay his head to rest at night. I was so sick to my stomach that it took me almost two hours to confiscate that article of clothing and check it for evidence. I won't elaborate, but you can infer what I mean. I was nauseated the entire time. All I could do was put on gloves, throw it into a Ziploc bag, and shove it into my closet. I didn't want to look at it or even think about it. I still don't. That answers the question of why David was so insistent on doing my kid's laundry. Who knows how long this has been going on? I've been ruminating on the next steps to take. Besides my main priority, going to the police, my other priority is telling my sister Sarah. We are obviously not on the best terms right now. She found out that I a, confronted her boyfriend last week and she is livid. How dare I accuse him of grooming my son? Well, apparently he's not the same man he was after we left and returned to his old habits. He was going back to bars with his friends every evening. His drinking got worse. He had stopped coming home early from work and dragged himself through the door at almost midnight, if he even bothered coming home, that is. And he was no longer affectionate toward her. Apparently, it's my fault he's depressed again. If those aren't red flags, I don't know what is. I can't tell if she is in denial or if she can't actually see them. Yeah, that's genuinely disgusting. The man is only keen on betting with you when an underage boy is in the house. Hmm. But what she's most concerned about is that David hasn't been home since Thursday. He went to work, came home briefly, then left again without telling her when he'd be back. In my head, that makes sense. He knows that either she or I took the garments that was inside of his pillowcase and now he's afraid to come home. It confirms all of my suspicions. I will tell my sister everything though, probably tonight or tomorrow. I have no idea 
how to go about it, and I guess I'm nervous about her reaction, she's still convinced that I'm having a manic episode. I was diagnosed with bipolar one many years ago, and I take medication to manage it. If I go off of my meds, my mania, and will progressively get worse until I spiral into psychosis. So her concerns are valid. I put her through a lot back when I wasn't stable. But that's not the current case for me now. I have tangible proof and video proof of her boyfriend being a creep. I can bring up the camera footage, but then I have the issue of not getting either of their consent to put a camera in their house. And I don't know how well that would go over with her, even if it was for a good reason. I just know that if I were in her shoes, I would be grateful that my boyfriend, or potential fiance, was outed as a predator before I got engaged to him. She's pretty much past the age of having children, but has plans to adopt in the distant future. So I have to tell her, somehow. Summarizing the rest of this post, because we still have one more update to go through. But mom and son don't need to be out of the house yet, but it's clear that the sister wants them out or doesn't want her around anymore anyway. David is still gone. Apparently, he's turned off his location as well, so there's no way for the sister to even track him. Assuming that he's just sleeping on a friend's couch. He's done that multiple times before. Thankfully though, because of his absence, she can feel comfortable staying at the house for now. And finally, onto good news, they got approved for public housing. Turns out they're going to be moving in just over three weeks, which is still a bit of time, but at least some time to prepare and get their ducks in order. To which she leaves with a question asking, how does she go from here? Does she just dump everything to the police and say, off you go, do your thing? What sort of charges sh can she bring up? Are the messages considered harassment? Do you let the sister be known about this? Or do you keep her in the quiet in case she tries to do anything that screws the situation up? Which of course many in the comments are quick to offer the best advice they can, including take the article of clothing out of the Ziploc and put it in a paper bag. Plastic bags degrade DNA evidence. And thankfully it seems OP took this advice. So two weeks pass since that update and we go to the latest one a week ago. Notably by now, the OP's entire profile and everything was deleted. Because unfortunately, as you're about to read in this update, things escalate to the point where a lawyer needs to get involved. And of course they needed to remove the evidence of this being something that could affect the court case. A quick welcome paragraph thanking everyone for the all the help they've been giving over the time and giving a heads up to what we should expect. In my last update, I left off with David's disappearance after I found out what he did with my son's clothing and confiscated it. It turns out that David was not on the run, nor missing, nor crashing on a friend's couch. He holed up at his parents' house and is still currently there. My sister informed me that due to my accusations of him grooming my son, David had a mental health crisis. She hopes I'm happy with myself and she feels the need to stay with him for support. So in other words, he's hiding at his parents' house because either the guilt is getting to him or he's scared or both. His entire family is infuriated with me. Whatever story he's feeding them is making me look insane in their eyes. Not once did they ask me for my side of the story. After I went to the police, my sister made the decision to kick me out of her home. I saw it coming a mile away, so I'm not too upset by it. I just wish she didn't feel such fierce loyalty to him and his family. I don't even know how to explain to my kid that his aunt doesn't support him. She does know I was approved for housing and that I have no other place for our belongings at the moment, so she at least has the decency to let us keep our stuff there until we can finally move out. I I guess that counts for something. Not much else to say about that. I've just been trying to keep my distance. David's behavior though got so much worse during this mental health crisis. The harassment escalated to stalking under the guise of wanting to clear the air. He showed up to Roman's baseball game that was held at a different school to try and speak with him. That means he found his schedule, the exact time he was playing, and the address of that school. He found the motel we'd been staying at. We had to move to a different one after this incident. Created three other Instagram profiles to message him about how this is all a misunderstanding, how much he misses him, etc. Some of these messages were awful. Things like, don't let other people make decisions for you, and you're old enough to decide who should be in your life and who shouldn't. Paragraphs and paragraphs of him pouring his heart out to my son and begging him not to tell me that he's been reaching out. This harassment has left my son completely disillusioned. After screenshotting everything, I asked him not to read the messages anymore and to just delete them. At that point, I wanted to take his phone away, but I knew he'd resist me for that. Maybe I made the wrong decision. Maybe I didn't. I don't know. The day David found our motel was one of the most traumatic moments of my life. I don't know how he found us. My sister knows I've been staying at a motel, but I never told her which one. On that day, it was about 9pm and I needed to go to the corner store to grab something. My son was taking a shower and getting ready for bed as he had school the next day. The corner store was a minute's walk away. The room we were staying in was visible from the windows of the store. I'd made this quick trip countless times. In the moment, I didn't 
wouldn't feel unsafe leaving my kid behind. But hindsight is always 2020. I already feel stupid. No need to tell me. But David had parked at the lot across the street. And I didn't see his car. He waited until I was almost at the store and my back was fully turned to go for our motel room door. It was obviously locked. So I, he started knocking. But by then I had already heard him and was running in his direction. I nearly blacked out from the fear and adrenaline. And it's hard to remember much. I recall that he didn't seem angry. He just had this miserable, panicked look in his eyes. He really did look like someone who was going through a mental health crisis. I told him I was calling the police and that he needed to leave. He said that he was entitled to a conversation with me, but he ran off once he saw me dialing 911. To me, his reasoning was bull. He keeps saying that he wants to conversation and to clear the air with me, but if that were true, then why didn't he approach me? He knew I wasn't in the room. Why did he essentially try to break in where he knew my son was alone? I of course documented this incident with the police, which I will get into right now. On Monday, March 27, the day after my last update and days before the aforementioned events occurred, I went to the police for the first time. The police officer I spoke with sat me down and gave me the opportunity to talk about everything, how David was very close with Roman, what I caught him doing with his clothes, the messages, etc. Thank God for these posts, because I found myself referring back to them. Memory can be unreliable. I presented the evidence that I had as well. I showed the video footage and gave her the article of clothing I confiscated, as well as the text messages and Instagram and TikTok messages. She then told me she would contact the district attorney, which she did soon after. I was shocked by how fast the process was moving, and she told me that since it involves the potential intimate abuse of a minor, they don't want to waste any time. I was interviewed again by a detective, and a couple days later, they called David in for an interview. By then, the stalking had begun. During my second interview, I showed him the new messages David sent, and told him about how David showed up to the school and the motel. Hell, I don't know what they asked David during his interview, but I can imagine that he denied everything and spun up a web of lies to try and make me look crazy. I'm not really concerned about him though. With all of the evidence I have, David should be very, very nervous. A detective interviewed my son as well. This is what worried me the most. And I insisted that if they didn't have to do it, I'd rather they didn't question him at all. But they said it would help build a stronger case. And I trust them. I was told I had to be there during his interview, since he is a minor. Roman only knows about the stalking and harassment but he has no idea about what David did with his clothes and I want to keep it that way for as long as I can. I personally asked the detective not to bring it up. I'd just like to shield him from it all. And this is where Roman confesses to something that really nails the coffin. They asked my son about the messages and the stalking as well as their relationship. When asked about any physical contact they had, Roman brought something up that he didn't initially tell me about. He said there was one instance when he and David were in the living room watching a show called Stranger Things. David randomly placed his hand on my son's chest, left it there for a moment, then said, I'm glad you're alive. I don't really know what to make of that, but combined with everything else he's done, it's very disturbing. I asked my son about it afterward, and he said that he didn't tell me because it didn't make him feel uncomfortable. As an isolated event, I guess it could seem like an innocent act to a 13-year-old, so I understand why he didn't bring it up, but I don't know. All I can do is take his word for it. In terms of the case, they are now requesting a warrant of arrest with the clerk of the court. If this is granted, then David will be arrested in charged with lewd and lascivious behavior, harassment, and stalking. He could end up getting up to five years in prison, maybe even more since a minor is involved. So that's where I'm at right now, waiting for the clerk's decision. The waiting game is stressful, but I'm trying to focus on the positives as much as I can. It's nice to see how fast the police and detectives are working and how serious they are taking my case. All I can do is trust that the outcome will be in my favor. It hasn't sunk in yet that my situation has developed into this. It's been difficult for me to wrap my head around where David's sudden attachment stemmed from. I was under the impression impression that predators are in general weird around children, but he never acted this way around other children, only mine. When he started dating my sister, she told me that David didn't want kids, and she was trying to convince him to change his mind. That's why she was so happy to see him and my son bond. Someone previously commented that in David's mind, he might believe that there's a legitimate romantic connection between him and my son. I don't know if there's any validity to that, and the idea of looking into it makes me nauseous. I'd rather not speculate and just pray that he gets arrested soon. But the rest of the other Update, they go on to tell how Roman hasn't really been taking this well. He's doing fine in school, but every now and again, he does a thousand yard stare, his eyes bereft of any sort of awareness. He's not eating as much as he usually does, constantly saying he doesn't feel well. While it's nice to see that he's being open about his state of mind and being, it's unfortunate that she can't afford him therapy right now. Meanwhile, for her, it seems her body's finally caught up with the entire stress of the moment, and she's also feeling extremely exhausted, distressed, and constantly on alert. End of the day, she definitely did win this battle, but it has come at a great cost.
still, of course, with the account deleted and scraping herself from the online footprint, can only hope that things have gotten brighter for her to give her more sense of closure and peace, both for her and for Roman. Overall, that is where things leave off, and we'll have to wait and see if there is a further update that hopefully brings a brighter conclusion. For now, though, thank you for watching this video. It's been a bit of a long one today, so I appreciate you for sticking to the end. You be good, love your face, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.